Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Deep Tech Studio. Emerging technologies are gaining ground and governance is one aspect that can benefit from it, from ensuring transparency to quicker, efficient method of operation. And working on ground and partnering with state governments on several projects is Lumos Labs. A Singapore-based innovation management firm, Lumos Labs, with its carefully curated accelerators, corporate programs, and investment support helps early stage startups enter the growth phase. It also assists corporates in connecting with startups and service providers. And to talk to us in detail about the innovation management, we have co-founder of Lumos, Kavya Prasad. Welcome, Kavya. Glad to have you here. Hey, Rashmi. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Kavya, talk to us about the germination of the Lumos Labs idea. For sure. Um, okay, so uh, it's pretty serendipitous, right? Like how uh, Lumos Labs actually came into being. Um, so in um, I graduated um, as an architect in 2015. And finally, you know, I'm in the crux of like a huge deep tech moment, movement right now. But um, uh, as an architect, I didn't want to continue in the same field. And I uh, sort of transitioned into design um in, in 2016 and started working as a graphic designer in a couple of uh, startups back in the day which is where i uh, started kind of getting into products and uh, you know learning about engineering in the startups uh, um after a couple of stints in uh, some startups i um partnered with my current co-founder at Lumos Labs to start off a freelance um, um, business where uh, we were helping build communities for organizations. Uh, they weren't really in Web3 per se, they were all across and uh, we were essentially handling marketing, community, community building, design and content for some startups. Um, while we were doing this, we came across a couple of Web3 organizations that we got the opportunity to work in and uh, that's when we started exploring the space and realized, you know, how vast this entire uh, started uh, delving deeper into that and started working in with more and more uh, Web3 organizations. After a point, we realized that, you know, the two of us can't do this just by, by ourselves and decided to, you know, scale it up. So we set up an entity, started uh, doing this at an organization level. And, uh, you know, that's how Lumos Labs is essentially inserted. And um, now we're doing it for, you know, governments and uh, the largest of the Web3 organizations across the globe and at a more, in a more streamlined fashion. So uh, it is, it has been a, it, quite a journey uh, getting here, but uh, yeah, it's been fun for sure. Kavya, now that you've spoken about uh, Web3, I mean, how the idea came through, um, talk to us about your participation in Build for Bharat initiative. Uh, as the country is now focused on going into the Atman uh, phase, how how has uh, Lumos Labs contributed? Who are your partners? What are you actually fac facilitating? Right. So uh, we started the Bill for Bharat initiative with uh, Binance at the time, Binance India, and uh, the objective there was to uh, unearth, you know, the best of the best Web three solutions. Uh, that India could, uh, you know, potentially muster up, right? Uh, uh, we were looking at uh, solutions that could impact India in any way possible, right? And we actually unearthed some really, really good startups in uh, through this uh, hackathon. In fact, it was a hackathon and it was supposed to be something that, you know, developers would build and explore and tinker around with. But we actually saw some really good startups come up uh, from uh, the entire uh, program. So this ran for about four months. Uh, it initially started with, you know, developers just being interested in the technology and uh, slowly started looking at, you know, startups looking at this more seriously and coming in as well. So a couple of interesting startups to name. There was an organization called Brew. Of finance, they are essentially in the in the lending side of things, and uh, they are basically um, uh, um, NFTizing uh, real world assets like crops uh, to uh, you know uh, help uh, farmers get loans at a quicker uh, pace, right? Without having to go through a bank and show so many documentations through uh, crypto, where you know there would be uh, stakeholders on the DeFi end who would essentially. Uh, loan them some money to get started with a business or whatever they would need. So this was a very noble cause. And uh, I, this was one of the best startups to come out. I think they were one of the winners as well. Uh, another organization called Mupay, they're in payments uh, for crypto, essentially, you know, raise a pay for 
uh, crypto, I would say. Uh, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, they're, again, a uh, very, very good startup, recently funded as well and uh, doing really well. So all the startups that came out through this uh, program have uh, also figured out, you know, getting funding and starting up full time and doing this at a larger scale. So it's been a, a very impactful um, program, I would say, overall. And the strand was quite interesting to hear about uh, group finance and fortunately we had them as a speaker for our deep tech event as well so we gained some good insights yeah. over there um, mm -hmm. now talk to us about the governance projects kavya and about the role blockchain plays and how have you been involved in various government governance projects and i know to an extent that you work with the telangana government so if you could talk to us about that as well for sure. So our uh, first stint with the government was running an accelerator for them and Tech Mahindra together. Uh, this was called T-Block and uh, it was essentially to find uh, social impact uh, startups that uh, that also use blockchain, blockchain technology or any other deep tech in their solution. Uh, right. And uh, um, through the course of that accelerator, we've actually um, um, found about seven very, very good impactful uh, startups and uh, the government of Telangana even piloted with one of them. Uh, they're called, um, uh, uh, um, I forget the name. Um, I, I will remember and I'll let you know what the name is, but uh, uh, they, uh, they start, this was basically a seed traceability uh, solution in the supply chain and uh, basically uh, farm to fork, right? And it traces the entire thing through blockchain and with the transparency aspect of it. Um, so that was one really big uh, startup that came out and they're actually doing uh, really well right now. And uh, we saw some um, uh, supply chain solutions on the blood, blood bank side. So um, a, a company called... Um, Again, I forget the name. Uh, it's been a while. It's been three years since we did this startup. I mean, this accelerator, and there were about seven startups that came out, and uh, about three of them got funded through this accelerator. And um, uh, an overall of one point two million dollars have been funded into these seven startups uh, through this uh, um, through the course of the accelerator by uh, other members outside of the program. But they, you know, they came into the limelight through this accelerator, right? So essentially, uh, this has really helped, uh, you know, helped uh, some startups actually get to the next level and scale up. So uh, that was our first stint with uh, the, the Telangana government. Uh, we recently then launched uh, the India Blockchain Accelerator uh, right now. Um, this happened in December, where, uh, again, this was uh, to uh, get to the next level of blockchain, right? Like we started with a simple supply chain and enterprise solutions in blockchain. Here now, uh, Rama Devi Ma'am uh, in, in the uh, launch event actually said that she was looking at, you know, NFTs and, and metaverse projects. And she's actually very bullish on, on these, um, you know, uh, sectors of blockchain. And she wants to look at more startups like that that actually delve into uh, the P2E economy and, and the whole um, how metaverses are kind of growing into this, uh, um, into blockchain. So uh, that is something that she's looking forward to within this uh, accelerator. So they're kind of going one step uh, ahead as well. That apart, um, we've uh, helped connect a lot of uh, blockchain companies to the government. And recently, uh, Near Protocol, which is a layer one, uh, has uh, partnered with the Telangana government to start a learning program uh, where they are uh, essentially going to teach blockchain or Web3 to uh, students in, in Telangana in, in several colleges and universities. So, um, uh, you know, that uh, basically that introduction really helped that, uh, you know, make happen. So uh, the Telangana government is very open to uh, getting, uh, you know, uh, partnering with blockchain projects and uh, actually um, educating the youth about what this is, um, you know, how this is the future and how they should you know, learn it now and actually delve into this sooner than later. So um, I, um, that that has been another, you know, big step on the on the government front. And uh, that apart, uh, we are looking at, you know, working with the government. They're very bullish on blockchain as well. And uh, there are conversations happening there as well. Uh, so essentially, uh, this is what we've been doing with the government. And they've been very, very supportive in the whole process. Andhra Pradesh is another government that's interested as well. And they have a whole... Um, um, education side to blockchain again and they want to partner with us on the recruitment front where we could connect them to organizations that are looking to recruit you know blockchain developers or people who are interested in this sector so uh, we're seeing a lot of governments sort of come into this space now and uh, you know taking it one step at a time but in a in a very positive manner understood kavya and there was one follow-up question that i wanted to ask you now the impact of these technologies can be fully realized when 
we have certain use cases that we can look at and understand the impact. Uh, when Ramadevi Lanka spoke about NFTs and metaverse uh, for governance, what do you envision some of the use cases to be? Um, so in, in terms of metaverses, I think um, the use case for government governance could be essentially establishing, you know, virtual uh, headquarters for uh, governments within India to kind of collaborate in a, in a faster manner and having sort of a token economy to incentivize maybe, um, you know, decision making or, or um, you know, faster decision making or good behavior, right? So that could be an interesting use case for governments to uh, explore and um, um, implement maybe. Um, that's something I can see. Um, that apart, um, you know, uh, digital goods. Uh, so basically uh, having, uh, you know, a digital version of a physical good uh, sold in the metaverse where, you know, you can access both. You get the phys physical version to you and a uh, digital version as an NFT uh, to showcase that this is you, you own this and, you know, it's 100% yours. It's something that could be explored as well in the metaverse. And that's being done at a, at a smaller level with uh, small retail stores. Uh, I think recently Nike, uh, has gotten into the metaverse and actually set up a store on Sandbox to do the same. Uh, so has Adidas. But uh, um, you know, we can do this at the largest scale for the Indian goods. You know, like um, you know, the um, there are some places in India where you have uh, authentic Indian dolls being uh, created. Right, there's a place in Karnataka. Uh, where, uh, yeah, where these Chanapatna dolls are being uh, created. So how about having this as an NFT to show that this is authentic? And, you know, there are a lot of people trying to Im uh, imitate this, but this is not real, right? So how do we how do we sort of collaborate and make sure that the original version of that doll is reached to the person who uh, buys it and gets an NFT to also prove that it's original? So, you know, things like this could be uh, done within the metaverse and NFTs to governance. Thank you, Kavya. That was interesting to understand. Now, uh, could you talk to us about your revenue model? Uh, yes, you connect startups and the corporates and startups and the governments benefited. Uh, how does your revenue model function? So we essentially take a management fee from the clients that we work with, like for Build for Bharat, we work with Binance, and there was a, a fee that we took from Binance to essentially um, execute the entirety of this uh, from uh, getting in startups, uh, you know, marketing, branding, PR, positioning to, uh, you know, shortlisting the startups, talking to them, understanding what their, um, you know, what their use cases are, do they fit into this program, to the thesis of the program, and uh, organizing events to, uh, you know, build more more um, a mind space and mind share for these programs. So all of these activities are done within that managing fee. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, but with the government, this was uh, completely uh, something we did because we wanted to uh, partner with the government and actually build some impact. So this wasn't a paid engagement as such. Coming now, we have to um, we have to understand that women have made much stride in the STEM, uh, but it is. Uh, somehow still essential and the conversation still are, are still around how to bring women to the forefront in deep tech. What are some of the unique challenges uh, women face in deep tech and how can we bring them to the forefront? Got it. So um, I think um, for this question, we need to kind of step back, right? Like start from the very beginning. Um, and if you're taking India in particular as an example, right? Um, um, it starts from the upbringing itself, right? Like how... Uh, how have you been treated in your household in terms of uh, studies, right? Like if uh, every time there's a boy and a girl child in a house, the boy is always encouraged to do engineering, but the girl child is always encouraged to go into, you know, healthcare, maybe uh, healthcare or phone science or design, you know. And that's something that has kind of stemmed from the grassroots, right? And I think we need to, uh, you know, strike that change at the grassroots, right? Like having your um, uh, peer, your friends, your family, um, your uncles and aunts actually encourage you to get into this stream, right? After that, there are more challenges. So when you get into um, engineering, this is a very masculine environment. There are more men than women, and uh, it has been the case for many years now. Um, how about having your peers in college be more considerate and respectful towards women, right? Uh, instead of uh, probably saying, you know, giving them the menial jobs uh, in terms of, you know, group projects. When Because I have a lot of friends who have done engineering, I myself didn't. But all of them, when they do say that, hey, I'm working on my, you know, group project with my uh, college friends, um, you know, the, the men get to do the engineering tasks while the women get to do the documentation side. 
So how about you know having that equal distribution there? Um, even um, you know professors. Uh, there are stories about professors sort of uh, you know demoralizing women in very subtle ways where um, it doesn't really show up. But when you think about it, you realize that you know that that was a little bit of sexism there, right? Um, for example, uh, I had a couple of friends who uh, were a team of a group of girls who created a very cool robot for their you know final year project in college. And at the end of this, and they showcased it. Uh, the professor essentially said, "You know, you look like uh, models. You know, holding up the the, the uh, robot. But how about you know appreciating them for the work that they've done?" So these small nuances, I think, need to need to start changing, right? Like, I don't think having a women-only clubs and women-only hackathons is the solution, honestly, because that that is again women encouraging women. But I think uh, it needs to stem from your peers, from the men, right? Uh, to be more respectful, take uh, women more seriously. If you're wrong, respectfully correct them, right? Don't mansplain uh, the answer to them. So these sort of, sort of small changes would, I think, encourage more women to actually get into this stream. And we're seeing a huge drop off after engineering, where women kind of, uh, you know, uh, wrap up their career in engineering, get into something else. Uh, why is that happening? It's probably the work environment there that they're, you know, facing a lot of sexism as well. So I think it it needs to start from everybody, and have, uh, I'm not a big fan of you know women only clubs because I don't think that is going to be the solution to increasing women in the space. It has to be a community effort where men, women, fathers, mothers, everybody come in and actually encourage women to do this because the capability is there. It, it, it's just a little harder right now because of the the subtle uh, you know um, sexist comments here and there that come in. So um, I would say that would be the the solution to kind of increase the number of women coming coming into the stream. Thank you, Kavya. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for taking time out um, and talking to us about know more about the women in deep tech and also about telling us more about metaverse and about the upcoming project. It was nice having you on this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vishnu. Thanks for having me.